This is Mark Falkenberry, and I want to do an intro for this bio or uh, piece or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I called it Mark's Memoirs for lack of thinking of a bigger, better title. Uh, so I wanted to let you know uh, whoever's ever going to watch this, you know, what it is and what it ain't. And what it is is a straight documentary thing about bands and some of the styles that I learned and some of the things I did. Uh, and. Uh, purposely, I've left a lot of the juicy type of stories and all that kind of stuff that people want to hear about musicians. I left that out. It can be done later in a later video because two reasons. First, this thing is long enough as it is. And then uh, I have to figure out how to do it without necessarily hurting people or, you know, making people look good or look bad or, you know, it's, it's not about that. So as far as the actual music itself, I've left that out. Uh, except for a couple of little bits and pieces that I'm going to try to record later on the guitar, just very demonstration short things. Uh, so this is the intro of this entire thing, so I'll, you know, make of it what you will. Hi, this is Mark Falkenberry. Mark William Falkenberry is my official given name. I was born December 22nd, 1948, in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, this is my musical history to start, and so I'm going to go through the years and tell you the musical things, bands, uh, sort of highlights, and part two, and we can get into the more of the, you know, the pictures and posters and the details of the gigs. So I started in 19, really 58, uh, when I sang in the Catholic Church Choir, and everyone that was for the 1959 school play that was uh, singing in the school choir, they recruited uh, with the nuns, just like the Blues Brothers or the poker, <laughs> Requ you know, required us to go to the auditorium and be in a minstrel show. So my first gig was singing, and I sang before I ever learned how to play an instrument. Um, so uh, in 1960, I was a kid, and uh, of course, uh, not 12 years old, went and bought Teen Idol records and tried to sing with them because that's what all you know a lot of kids did then. And then I went to my first concert, which was at the State Fair uh, in the Coliseum, uh, which was the Dick Clark Caravan of Stars. And I saw such astounding acts as Anita Bryant doing Tilda Would You. And I, you know, my memory is great, so I'm glad we're doing this. Well, I still have one, but anyway. Uh, Kid, Freddie Boom Boom Cannon was put on an incredible show with horns and everything. I'd never seen anything like that because my granny used to take me every year to the state fair on the streetcar. And so the main thing that I saw that impressed me, although I never thought about it until later, was uh, I heard the first electric guitar ever live. Um, and Dwayne Eddy was playing Rebel Rouser, and after that Santa and Johnny were playing and he was doing Sleepwalk with the pedal steel and I never thought I'd ever play or ever was interested in it but the main thing was they were able to fill up an auditorium with just the sound of that amplified and where everybody else needed a big band and so you know it's kind of stuck with me about the concert thing and my father had played and such so a little even though I was he had quit before I was even born so moving along in 1962 we started singing to soul records you know, uh, you know, me and a couple friends, just like everybody did at Motown, which was really starting to get going around that year. Uh, in 1963, I started trying to sing to Surfman Records, because they had, you know, little harmonies that every kid, you know, could kind of do. And uh, I saw the first actual bands uh, when I went to the Wall Lake Casino and some other places that had live bands, but also, uh, this is kind of important, that the bands they had uh, a lot of times didn't play live. They lip-synced their records in a live situation in the theater. <laughs> you go there and they, you know, so we saw Eddie Holland doing Leaving You, and we saw Del Shannon doing Runaway, and we saw, you know, guys like this, you know, and so it was a, it was a start. So uh, in 1964, uh, I started high school. I met my friend John Angelos uh, in gym class, and we got in a fight almost, and then we became friends, you know, just like guys would do. And anyway, uh, he had this idea because we were in play production classes together, and I was no longer involved with the church, but I was doing the, you know, plays, and, uh, you know, 
meeting girls and being, you know, kind of stood off by them uh, anyway, you know, because I was, you know, shy, which people wouldn't believe now about me. But then, you know, I had a kid. And I went to the school place, and then we started being in the school place because it was able to uh, boost your grade average up. For all the other classes you might be failing, you were able to, uh, you know, make up a little bit of it by, you know, getting a grade just for showing up because they didn't have many guys in the school place then. Uh, it was mostly girls. And so we started singing and horsing around. And so the first actual band that we got was only because the girl that was a grade ahead of us, it was a homecoming type person. And uh, my friend Angelos was, you know, thinking he could get with get with her. So he figures, well, we'll make a band up. And, it, and the first band we actually had was Sandy and the Sandmen. We were the Sandmen that were being the backup singers. And uh, she was Sandy trying to sing. Uh, and it didn't work out because she wasn't singing. And she got wise to what he was doing. And he was, you know, it wasn't it was a personal endeavor, not musical. So, uh, but in his basement, we were able to start out. So. Just before we got instruments and started trying to play, there was an ad in Motown paper. And, you know, Motown ad. And we went down there and tried out. Uh, and we stayed up all night like kids would, and, you know, thinking of what we're going to meet. We're going to meet Stevie Wonder, and we're going to have a temptation. And then it was nothing like that. We went down there, we could get a 20 minute audition uh, where the tape recorders were rolling in case they caught anything because nobody copyrighted anything and they were able to keep all that stuff. We which probably came out later, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to get into that, but anyway, uh, we got this little white guy to play piano, and all right, boys, you know, <laughs> and so a million of these kind of guys around at those times had little music stores and little things for people, kids to try to, and they usually tried to sucker you into lessons or something, and we tried to audition, and he's, oh, you boys go home and learn some harmonies and come back, so that was the end of that, but I still got to put it down because it was the first time we were in a, uh, a studio, and just after that, uh, we decided to make a band up. Uh, John had gotten word from England from, through the Monster Magazine connection that they had music magazines coming from uh, Liverpool, Mercy Magazines and stuff. You know, the Mercy Beat Monsters even in there. I remember the guys dressed in monster costumes or band. And so, uh, and we got, in. Uh, along with that, we got the Rolling Stones, uh, which I still got the album on the wall because at the end of the other side was the Rolling Stones fan club. And we thought, well, this is great because we started out listening to the blues and we thought about it. Um, and so we decided to make the Shades, which is our first band, which made we wore sunglasses and we're kids just trying to do blues and, and Chuck Berry and stuff like that. So we, we did that in the basement. So I practiced seven hours a day. Uh, every day of the week for two years before I thought it was even decent enough to think about playing out. So the Shades mostly played in the basement and kids we knew from school would come over there and John's mother would give us, uh, you know, chips and pop to, you know, you know don't leave any cigarette butts in the basement, you know. But here I'm going into stories again, so I'm going to move ahead. And uh, after that, I got my first guitar and, you know, along the same time, of course, because I said I was practicing. And then, in 1965, we had the Heartbeats Band, which started to be a professional unit because we had a couple guys that didn't go to our school. You know, the first band with the Shades was me, John Angelos, and Tony Backus as a trio, which I ended up playing in a lot of trios in life for some reason. And the second one was a five-piece band with a guy playing harmonica and screaming in the microphone. And, you know, and John, playing bass, uh, so we needed a bass player, so he switched over from guitar to bass, and I tried to play lead guitar, you know, uh, not so well probably, but anyway, we were able to be in the battle of bands at school and such, you know, like this, so we put, started playing in the metro area, and one thing that's important to mention is uh, this is the middle of Beatlemania, so we actually played at some girls' schools and things where uh, we got the Beatles treatment because they were just repressed. I mean, the whole sexual revolution thing was starting, which I won't get into now, of course. But anyway, uh, screaming girls, tearing your clothes off and stuff like this. It was us, but they'd never seen a band before. You know, so they thought, well, this is what they're doing on TV for the Beatles. That's what we should do. So, I mean, in a way, it was going over great. And you're getting, because you know, there was so much pent-up demand 
for live musicians, and not very many, I wouldn't say there was more than five or 10 uh, bands of people our age that were professional bands in all of the Detroit area at that time. So moving along to 66, uh, I got the Blanket Blues Band together with John, and we had different guys, uh, of course, that were from our school. Uh, Tony, the drummer, came back, and he played, and we made our first record at Tara Sherman Studios, which uh, was uh, where Isaac Hayes recorded, I think, Hot Butter Soul, and we, were, we had our first close musician experiences with studio people, uh, where we met, you know, some of the people, you know, that were involved in Motown recordings, uh, you know, but they were doing demos there at the studio, which was kitty corner from John's father's little Greek restaurant on Franklin Liberty. So we, he did go in there for lunch. He said, well, you boys come over and we'll see how you do. So we signed a contract in 1966 to make an album. But we only made a single because the whole thing kind of fell apart with the studio falling apart later. But we did do that. We signed a contract, giving our parents most of the money. We were, you know, I was like, you know, barely. I wasn't 17 yet. So after that, 1967, uh, I branched out a little uh, because the, the Black and Blues band, you know, they played at the Grandy and such, and, and it was going good. And then later, I saw my buddy with the same band with a different guitar player. And he didn't tell me, and I went, "Well, I guess I'm out of a gig here." So. I went to uh, look in the paper, and there was an ad in the paper for a band in Wayne that was basically a hoodlum band, but they had a whole lot of equipment called the Belshires. And they were looking for a lead guitar player, so I went over there. I took the bus down Michigan Avenue from Dearborn Heights, where I basically grew up, which was Dearborn Township early. Uh, it was Dearborn Heights by this time. And I went over there and tried out in, with my friend Dave Rebel, who played rhythm guitar, and we were in the Belshires. So we played local gigs, just like Every other band it was more like a Yardbirds, like them type of band, I suppose you would call it. Um, and then that went south as usual, you know, just didn't have any kind of management to do much more. We didn't do any recordings. So in 1968, at the end of 1967, I moved downtown. I moved away, and I moved to Wayne State, where uh, I had met the MC5 before, but they lived in the same neighborhood with John Sinclair, and we kind of became part of their you know, family in a sense, because they, you know, they were the sort of the socialist thing in the best form of it, where it wasn't controlling anybody to do anything other than what you thought you should do. And uh, everybody made almost the same money anyway, so it wasn't, and they were a little bit ahead because they had recorded. So we became friends, and uh, I wanted to start up another band, you know, especially because I was out of the Bellshires, I was out of the Blanket Blues band, so I decided to start a band and there was a guy from Kansas that came there he said I had, I had a band called the Pink Peach Bob in Kansas said Pink Peach Bob that's pretty different even for now psychedelics oh yeah you know so he played with us but he took so much acid that you know like you see I would read these stories but anyway uh, he was out of it he left town and I did, couldn't think of anything but calling my old buddy Angelos back up and with the bass player and he became he came back in the situation as a trio and we met a manager uh, Colleen Kendall who's my friend to this day and she managed us f at first and uh, we got on a lot of big shows and the, you know and the biggest one I guess we did was you know the Grandy which is one of the biggest venues for us local guys then uh, where we played with Big Brother Holding Company which was Janis Joplin's band at that time so a lot of people came and saw us and there's a whole reason why that ended up folding up after all that. Uh, so in 1969, once again, I'm moving on to a different band. I met Rocket Reggie, who had gone to my school as Reginald Vinson, and then they called him Vince Vinson back then. And I didn't know him in school, but I got introduced to him through Angelos. So he, the Angelos went in different groups. I stayed with this and met a couple other guys and became my lifelong friends, musicians, and we were uh, in the Dutch Elm, which is already Dutch Elm when we joined it because it was Rock and Reggie's basic band, and I was a guitar player being behind people, which is happening most of the time. Of course, at, you know, at night we would go out and hear, uh, you know, blues guys and jam with them because there was always a little bit of that thread, you know, in my life always. I didn't know it would become major as it did later. Uh, but. Uh, we were almost signed, but we, you know, to record deals, but things were not working out so great. Anyway, after that, Rocky Reggie left and went with Alice Cooper, 
had a uh, billion dollar babies and made a lot of money and of course we got nothing but anyway it doesn't matter it, it folded uh, and it morphed into Mighty Quick which ended up playing at every basic venue that there was uh, and you know we did some pretty big shows later in this Goose Lake and the Cincinnati Pop Festival but there's a reason for the article that came out in Rolling Stone about it that I wasn't involved in exactly I was done with it but yeah, in the meantime, we played lots of great gigs at the Birmingham Palladium and other places. A little bit with Grandy when it was still open. Uh, the biggest, best show we did, I thought, was uh, East Town with Rod Stewart and The Faces and Samway Brown, where everything went right and it was a lot of fun. You know, but th there's an ending to that. So now moving on to 71. Uh, I got a band together with my old buddies who were known kind of guys. You know, Bill White, Keith Johnstone, Bill White was the original bass player, the Ted Nugent, Amway Dukes, and we were friends. After he got back from Vietnam, we made a band, uh, and I got in a lot of trouble with it later because of the name, because I thought of this name, Magic Rape. And saying rape, after a while, people didn't understand it, but at the time, we ran it by our girlfriends. They didn't have any problem with it at all. I just thought, well, we're raping people with our music, you know, everything. But it didn't last too long, and then, uh, those guys went back and played with Ted, and I was left without a band again. But there's another story. So I got fed up with this sort of thing, and I thought, well, I got to try to start having my own band. But this time, still pretty much pretty rock. So yeah, you know, but blues thrown in there, like a lot of bands did. A lot of English bands we know did that. So we were not that different, except I was starting writing a lot of songs. And uh, then it, you know, John's father called me Flackenberry because he couldn't pronounce Falkenberry. To him, I was Marsh Flackenberry because he was a Greek guy. So my close friends would call me Flackenberry, or Flack for short, so I made a band Flack. And then after that, we started doing pretty well at a lot of teen clubs and parties and, and small concert venues. Uh, the biggest show we did with that was uh, us and Steve Miller at Ford Auditorium, which you know was a success. And then. Uh, then I went to California because there was no way to make a record around here any place. There was no recording companies or anything left. So I went there in 1973. Uh, I played some gigs in Hollywood. And our whole band moved there from 73 to 76. And 76 it wasn't going that well, really. And one of the guy's fathers got sick. He had to move back here and get replacements in the usual. So I came back here in 77. I went on the road with a classic rock band that my buddy was in uh, where I got the gig by default because one guy was singing and I couldn't do it since I was becoming more of a lead singer at this point and you know fronting a band uh, I would get things because I needed to front a band they needed some they needed a member to, to so we went on the road we did that after that folded up I sat around for two years and I uh, just discussed it with everything I knew a change was coming for me, some kind of big change. I didn't know what it was or whether I would play anymore. I, you know, had doubts. But in 1979, a friend of mine, Bruce, came to me with the idea of starting Blues Band. You know, that we could just put some stuff in our car and the stuff we usually did at rehearsals, well, that would be how we do the gigs, you know. I wasn't writing any blues songs yet, so we did covers, but I started the West Side Blues Band. And in 1980 and 81, you know, we played at the Detroit Blues Festival. They had just built Hart Plaza downtown and uh, got to know a lot of the blues guys that were around then, which were totally different than the people later. So uh, after that, uh, I moved back to California with my second wife, uh, and I got involved with the Blues Society there by default, uh, in a way, a uh, guy had a heart attack and died that was a treasure of it. And the Southern California Blues Society had a big following in a club that, you know, five or six hundred people, and I never played too much. I, they didn't know I played. I just helped the old guys because I wanted to help them. They were on their last legs, a lot of these people. Um, and so I was around them, I jammed with them, and all like this, but in the end, uh, the main thing I did there in, in that stretch of California was to, you know, play one of my first big solo gigs with, uh, with Johnny Winter Show in Reseda, which has a whole story to that. So. I got to move on from there, and in 76 I got a divorce from my wife, I wasn't doing anything, but I was writing songs which I sent to Alligator Records and they had a bunch of critiques about what they didn't like about this or that, uh, and I had my 
suspicions about why they didn't want to use it. But anyway, they didn't use anything. And I came back to Michigan, and as soon as I did that, 86, uh, there was a blues boom going on. A lot of clubs, there was a lot of people. The blues Factory Agency was starting up. And since I was lonely and didn't have anything to do every night, and I was just sick about getting divorced because I didn't really want to move and all that. I'd be, you know, tired of having a gypsy wife for a while. And here it comes again. So uh, I planned to play with every blues guy in Detroit um, because, you know, casually, because you could do it by being a guitar player, playing with them a little here and there. They had a big blues festival at St. Andrews Hall. Uh, probably 1,500 people. It's unimaginable now, you know, over a blue show like that in Detroit for local guys, but we did them, and then there were clubs, and at that point, I decided if I was going to do anything, I was going to have to start my own band. So I started my own band, got the nickname The Reverend from the Blues uh, Factory Agencies. They saw me doing a song by myself, which I used to do when equipment would break down because, you know, you're standing there looking dumbfounded, well, I'll do this. You know, it, it looks like the Reverend doing it. And I hated that whole Reverend thing, but then it, I got to, it grew on me because I realized that other people liked it. So I kept some of the solo act in, and then I started writing some songs. And after that, I met the Alligators and started writing songs for them, and they did, you know, whole sets of them, which was pretty cool, flattering. You know, you feel like, you know, Mr. Songwriter, that everybody's going to do your stuff. You know, it wasn't like monetarily cool, but, you know, fame wise for a local guy. Pretty cool, there were too many guys doing that. So, you know, I did that. And so I played with those guys and wrote songs, had my own band starting up, and also did, uh, you know, fill-ins for every guy that played this sort of music, you know, in the Detroit area over time. Uh, so moving along here to, you know, get my notes together here. Um, you know, just before that, I played some things with other people that were bands. There was a guy, Freeman James, or you know, briefly played with him. Then there were some friends of mine that had a trio band called Tri Power, you know, and I played with them. So I was doing all this all at the same time because, uh, you know, I was by myself. It was better to stay home alone. <laughs> so, yeah, moving along with that, uh, I'm going into maybe 19, I don't know. 88 or so when I really hooked up with Blues Factory. 1990, uh, that's when I did the alligator thing and all that and uh, started making some recordings and tapes. Uh, then uh, I met an agent and she was an agent and I had three agents at one time so it was pretty wonderful because you had, you know, uh, could fill in a lot of blanks of what you weren't playing with uh, fill in things from these agents or things that they would book your own band to do. So. That kept going on until 1998. I uh, released my first real own CD uh, when CDs became viable enough for people to get them and you know, play them. And, uh, you know, started playing a lot of festivals and stuff around 2000 and stuff, you know, large speed CDs, those kind of things, uh, which I played every one of them until last year, you know, 23 in a row. You know, so I guess should mention that because I don't know if anybody else is going to do something like that in one venue, but. You have to have the venue last long enough, first of all, to do it. But anyway, the recession in 2008 started hurting all of us. Uh, you know, people, they think about the pandemic today, but before that, you know, the recession closed a lot of clubs. I remember one time, Blues Factory Agency had 22 rooms, just them, to play in, let alone the rest of them, you know. So we went ahead, played them, and then uh, that you know, I released another CD a few years later, and that... Uh, and I'm still doing things solo and originally you know, speaking and with the band today uh, and filling in for other people, you know, if I'm needed. So that concludes it, and I guess that's all for right now.